Hello um, and welcome to the fourth webinar instalment of the HPS presentation series. We're back today with a focus on the WHO Surgical Safety Checklist, um, its implementation and experiences from health partnerships. My name is Pippa Williams. I'm a grants officer here at THET um, and I'm joined um, in the room with me uh, with Lynette Griffith-Jones, um, another grants officer, and also joined remotely by our head of partnerships, Andrew Jones. Um, we're here today to introduce today's presentations and to ensure that the technical side of things hopefully runs smoothly. And just to run through a few of the kind of technical logistics, you should be able to see our screen at the moment. Um, and as attendees, you're all currently on mute, so we're not able to hear you. But if you do have any um, problems throughout the webinar, please, um, in your control panel, you should see a chat box where you can message us directly, um, and we can help sort those out for you. A recording of today's webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel, channel um, by tomorrow morning. Um, so please don't worry if you have problems with connectivity. Um, or in seeing the slides, um, as you'll be able to get these um, all tomorrow. Um, and we'll have some time for questions at the end and a kind of a discussion session with the panellists. But in the meantime, um, yeah, drop any questions or queries into the um, chat function. Okay, so to press ahead with, the, with today's webinar, I'd now like to hand over to Andrew to introduce a little background to the webinar. Um, so here you are, Andrew. Thank you, Pippa. Um, first of all, can I just welcome everybody to uh, this webinar, and, and in particular to our three presenters, Ilona um, uh, Walt Johnson from WHO and uh, Tom Weiser from uh, Lifebox, in, and, and very kindly getting up fairly early to, uh, to do this in California. So uh, our grateful thanks to you. So a bit of a background for this. Um, webinar is, is that a number of projects funded through the Health Partnership Scheme have focused on or included as part of a wider range of activities the implementation of the WHO Surgical Safety Checklist. And the rationale for this differs from project to pro project, but underlying each such intervention is a belief that patient outcomes will be improved. Now there is of course a caveat, um, even in the, if the highest standards of surgical care and safety are applied within the confines of an operating theatre, if there are other systemic failures in the health facility, such as a general, generally lax approach to patient safety, the efforts of surgical teams to protect the patient can very easily be undermined by what happens outside of the theatre or operating room. Uh, notwithstanding the caveat, though, we know that levels of success in implementing the surgical safety checklist, checklist are patchy. Um, this comes not only from our, our own direct experience and the experience of partnerships um, in this field, but it's reflected in other studies co conducted in high-income countries as well as in uh, low- and middle-income countries. So this webinar is one of a series of themed learning opportunities and will uh, bring together people who have studied the successes and failures of implementation and those who have been involved in implementation through their health partnership scheme projects. So, uh, firstly, I'd like to introduce Alona Johnston. Uh, Alona is Assistant International Advisor in Global Health at the Royal College of Nursing in London and is the lead for the RCN Zuno Health Partnership uh, working in Zambia. So, uh, over to you, Alona. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Elena. I'm control. Great. Thank you. Pippa, my presentation hasn't come up yet. Not sure. Do I need to do anything different? <laughs> Hang on, I'll just check that it should. <clears throat> okay, great, thank you. Okay, so um, thanks Andrew for the introduction. I'm um, the project lead for the RCN 
um, Zuno partnership project um, and I'm going to be focusing on the WHO surgical safety checklist component of this project. Uh, my presentation will be hopefully brief and there'll be a bit of time for questions at the end. Um, so firstly, unfortunately, Zoo, our partners in Zuna weren't able to join us for this. So to just give you a, a brief overview, Zuna is the Zambian Union of Nurses Organization, and it's a joint trade union and professional association for nurses in Zambia. Um, it has nearly 7,500 paying members and works through various special interest groups, um, as we'll see in the presentation, there, including one on theatre nursing. Our project um, came about with after a couple of years of, sort of discussing a potential partnership with Zuno, um, and we co-developed the goal, which was to build the capacity of Zuno to influence nursing policy and improve nursing practice in Zambia as it develops as a professional association. Um, within that, the kind of overarching goal is to build the capacity of Zuno. Um, to advocate on behalf of its nurse members and on behalf of nursing as a profession in Zambia. But within that, um, due mainly to the needs assessment we did in Zambia and also discussions with SUNO, um, we've integrated a piece on um, the surgical safety checklist, which kind of acts as a vehicle to demonstrate ZUNO's increasing influence. The main challenges we wanted to address through um, this piece on surgical safety um, was obviously the poor surgical outcomes, um, but um, I suppose less of a clinical focus, also the lack of communication and within theatres uh, across the various disciplines. Um, the hierarchy that we had observed in theatres and that Zuno had reported to us as being important to its members, and also a lack of recognition of the value of nurses speaking out and therefore lack of confidence and motivation in the nurses themselves to speak out if they saw something um, that they weren't happy with. So in this particular project, um, we're trying to address these by uh, moving on from the previous training workshops on the surgical uh, on the surgical safety checklist that have happened at UTH. Um, those have mostly focused on surgeons and anaesthetists separately. Um, this project supports a more of a multidisciplinary um, approach, I suppose, uh, with the focus looking at teamwork and communication, how to identify and raise problems, how to discuss concerns, how to um, find solutions, um, and within that, using a basic, the basic five steps of the WHO surgical safety checklist. So I think it's going to be quite different. Um, our approach has been quite different from your, what you'll hear later um, from Tom. Um, so it's it's much more of the in inverted commas, softer skills, I suppose, um, looking at those things like teamwork and communication. Um, those are the five steps, as you can see. And that's the, the sort of basic introduction for um, all the multidiscipline teams that we do at UTH. So within that, we involve the surgeons, the anaesthetists, the nurses, but also the porters who um, at UTH in Lusaka have, have got a very active role to play in the theatre teams. Um, so just a brief overview of what we've achieved so far. Um, the, the project started in April um, of last year. Um, it's a two-year project in total. Um, and so far we've trained 164 theatre staff um, across the four UTH theatre blocks. We have, we're supporting ongoing monitoring, mentoring and support visits from Zuno um, and our uh, project officer at Zuno goes, um, spends two or three days a week at UTH supporting those teams that have been trained um, and then there's the mop-up trainings and refresher training so any, uh, any team members that are struggling or um, need need a refresher training, they, they can attend those. And there's obviously the mop-up training is there's staff turnover for new members of staff who haven't been trained yet. And we've got some photos from our trainings. Um, as part of our project is 
building the capacity of Zuno itself as a professional association in Zambia, um, we wanted to make sure that they were um, gaining capacity to carry out the trainings themselves. So in the first one, uh, the first the first series of workshops, they were led by an RCN member um, who has extensive expertise in this area, um, but part of her, her role was also building the capacity of Zuno to take over these trainings and, and as you can see in the photos, our colleagues Rita um, in the most recent workshops um, in January, she actually led the workshops herself. Um, one of the other nice parts of the project that was not planned for but we, we got sponsorship from uh, for scrub suits so the the newly trained theatre teams from a uniform provider from the UK. Um, so there's just some photos of, of our team members that have been trained um, in the paediatrics team, uh, depart, uh, theatre. Sorry. Um, so in terms of the sustainability of the changes, um, we've emphasised from the beginning that these changes are part of changing working practices rather than a project. Um, but that was that was quite challenging to get across um, with just sort of irregular workshops and trainings. Um, what we did to try and increase the improve the sustainability, I suppose, at UTH was um, to identify through initial training workshops carried out by ourselves and Zuno, um, we identified 12 very motivated um, people who were very interested in um, using the checklist and getting their peers to, to use it. So they, uh, we've got surgeons, um, anaesthetists, nurses and porters as part of that champions group and we carried out a two-day intensive workshop with them um, looking at problem solving, how to support their peers, um, how to raise any concerns to, to their colleagues um, and also how to monitor use of the checklist. Um, they, we hope, will be providing support for really embedding the checklist um, into UTH daily practice uh, coordinated by Zuno and Zuno will have a role to play in leading the monthly team meetings of the champions team. Um, and so far that's going really well. We've got a you know, very motivated team and, and they seem very enthusiastic and keen um, and they're keeping logbooks to, to sort of keep a record of, of the, the kind of mentoring and support they're giving to their colleagues. And there are our team there with their certificates. Um, in terms of data collection, uh, there's, as many of you will know, uh, there's a lack of solid mortality and morbidity data that we found available at UTH. Um, so we had to find some other ways of trying to monitor the impact our project was having. Um, we've we've kind of designed I suppose, uh, um, a process to to um, assess the glitches that are observed during the, the briefings and the debriefs, and that's led by the nurse in charges of each theatre. We've got a kind of plastic counter system for self-assessment of the checklist which the in-charges encourage their team members to do after um, every list is finished and we're also recording qualitative statements from stakeholders um, and also colleagues at, at um, UTH. And the, the glitch and error data, although it's um, perhaps not as solid as the, the patient outcome data would perhaps like, is very important for the border advocacy work of Zuno um, because previously um, a lot of advocacy work has been quite vague um, without the data in in terms of what what's lacking in theatres for example um, or issues with staffing levels and now that's all recorded it gives a lot more solid foundation to um, to really build some of the advocacy work with the hospital management team. Um, so these are some of the, this is what I mean by the plastic counters we have in, in the, uh, um, outside theatres to so that team members can um, self-assess how they feel the checklist was used on that day. Um, so where we are now in terms of challenges, we'll start with the challenges. The main challenge, um, as Andrew highlighted in his statement about the caveat, 
um, around the checklist has really been the resources. However well the checklist steps are being implemented by teams, um, they're still they're still encountering the same struggles um, about often very very basic lack of resources, um, things like water supply, etc. And as I said, documentation of this is really vital to advocate successfully for any improvements to take place. Um, we've also encountered challenges more generally around um, supporting colleagues to carry out advocacy work, um, particularly in terms of the hierarchy um, within within um, healthcare professionals, I suppose, um, and that advocacy might be seen as um, might be perceived as being a criticism of um, how certain things are managed. So it's it's quite a sensitive topic, um, and it, it's it's a slow process, I suppose, and. Um, over a two-year project, it's it's quite challenging to get uh, sort of definite outcomes um, and and to identify definite definite Im impacts. Um, in terms of the achievements, as I said, we've had we've trained 164 staff at UTH with 12 very motivated champions. Um, part of the goal of the project is to um, I suppose increased recognition of Zuno as a professional association, and and that's been quite successful in getting recognition by the Surgical Society of Zambia and also the Zambia Ops and Gynae Association. And um, they've both been very appreciative um, of the work that Zuno has done, and and now involving Zuno um, a lot more in in their work. And then I've got some quotes there that we've recorded from various colleagues and. Um, and stakeholders in Lusaka, um, basically the feedback um, has been that really around the areas around teamwork and communication have really, really benefited from use of the checklist. The briefing particularly is very successful and generally all the teams now are doing the, the briefing and the, the debriefing. The timeout is more of a, a challenge to get consistently right, but um, in terms of the, the kind of communications particularly with porters and nurses being able to raise concerns or questions with surgeons and that's been really really successful so our next steps um, continuing to embed use of the checklist at UTH and then and, and uh, by basically supporting the peer leadership role that our champions have um, we're going to continue on the working on the advocacy piece, trying to get that data about the glitches um, and um, take it in a message that's of interest to decision makers and relevant to, to whichever decision makers we, um, we're targeting. We would like to expand to a, a district hospital um, in Cabwe using the lessons that we've learned from, from our work at UTH. Um, and we also hope that this two-year project working on the kind of teamwork and communications um, and the, those five steps of the, of the checklist will really be a foundation for perhaps further clinical training um, on, on aspects of surgical safety by other partners. So I think that's it from me. Um, Pip, I don't know if you want and if you want to uh, if anyone wants to ask questions now or wait for later. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Iona. It's been um, uh, it's been fascinating to hear first off just about an experience of actually trying to implement the the checklist through a health partnership, um, and also great to um, hear more about kind of the measures you've taken to try and increase the the sustainability of it, um, transferring the responsibility to Zuno, and also the kind of adequate support coming off that. Um, so we will just pause now. Um, um, unfortunately, we, we'll take kind of some more questions at the end, but Ilona um, is unable um, to, to stay until that point. So if anyone has any um, questions for Ilona at the moment and would like to ask them, um, we'll just pause for a couple of minutes. Um, you can do this in two ways. Um, so if you have a microphone, you can... Um, raise your hand, so there's kind of a little yellow hand button, um, and we can then invite you to speak um, and unmute you. Alternatively, you can type the question um, in the question panel on your control panel, um, and then we can read those aloud. If you don't have um, 
if you can't, if you don't have it right now, but um, you do have a question later, um, then please feel free to still send them in at the end, um, and we can pass them on to Ilona. But we'll just take a couple of minutes um, and see if anyone does have a question. Okay, um, so Elena, we've had a, a question in here from Mr. Ahmed, um, and he's asked, um, he said, thanks for your presentation. Um, what do you feel was the, oh, there's a couple coming in, hang on. Um, what do you feel was the main obstacle to the implementation of the surgical checklist? Thanks, hi. Um, I think the the main obstacle was probably the lack of communication um, between within the teams um, we obviously working through a nursing association uh, we had a lot of open discussions with the nurses the theatre nurses and they found that um, it had become so established that the process was that the um, surgeons would come in ask for the list and then just you know, call the first patient, um, and I think that had just become so established that there was no um, no discussion about how that could possibly change. So I think the fact that these workshops provided a, a multidisciplinary space for um, different professions to to actually raise their concerns and give them an option to do things a bit differently really helped. Um, and I think. Um, we've had, you know, we've obviously not everybody is on board. That, that rarely happens, but um, for, for the surgeons um, that have really um, thrown themselves into the project, they've they've had very good feedback and, and basically around the sort of efficiency of the of the theatres are much better because any um, any um, problems that could have been foreseen are generally raised in the briefing so actually the surgeons are really benefiting from that that efficiency as well um, so yeah I think definitely the biggest challenge was just the lack of communication as I said in terms of the actual improving the patient outcomes the, the kind of issue around resources is is a real problem um, but in terms of actually use of the checklist I, I would say it was around communication great and we, we've got one um from from Tom, uh, a fellow presenter that kind of follows on from this, um, and he's asked, uh, how did you engage the surgeons and anaesthetists in the workshops? Well, we um, when we uh, when we first sent out the invitations, we worked with um, the Department of Anaesthesia and the Surgical Society of Zambia um, to really try and get their buy-in uh, before we actually before they went into the workshop so there was that sort of level of support it wasn't just um, Zuno sending those invitations because I think to start with that probably wouldn't have have been very effective um, I think that the fact that we had a real expert um, in, in our member Jane Reed who um, was very involved in developing the, the checklist and has worked um, with WHO in the past um, and is a professor um, I think all those things kind of made um, made all the professions uh, more impressed and, and willing to listen. Um, and we used just we used really quite fun techniques. I suppose it sounds um, maybe sounds a bit silly, but I think you know we made it an interesting um, event. It wasn't just a listening and listening to a presentation and looking at some slides. We did role plays. Um, there were some films, um, and we had very kind of open discussions. So I think the the environment um, and the kind of approach that we took to teaching was was not a traditional one, and I think people generally um, responded to that. Great, Tom. I'll just um, unmute you as well. I'm not sure. Did you have um, anything further, or is that was that kind of response answer your question? No, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, and Walt, um, I see you sent through a question as well. Um, if I unmute you now, did you want to 
ask that to Ilona? Um, I just, it was kind of like the uh, first question, uh, where did you get the most feedback, uh, pushback? And then my second question was, I was really intrigued with your green and yellow and red chips, and people were putting a chip down at the end of the case. Um, if someone perchance put down a yellow or red one, did you discuss that with the whole team or just with the person taking the survey? Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I think in terms of the pushback, um, I'd definitely say uh, it was from the more senior surgeons. Um, I think in our um, in, in the in the workshops, they they were probably less willing to attend and then maybe less willing to participate and change things. Um, but the the I suppose maybe more junior surgeons have um, been very motivated and committed. Um, so I think it's one of those things that. Um, hopefully we'll gather <laughs> ahead of steam um, and the more the more people are talking about it and, and uh, talking about it in a positive way I think you know even those people that are still not fully engaged will, will come on board um, in terms of the little counters um, it's it, it's not we don't people don't put them in individually it's kind of anonymous thing I suppose on the way out so um, we at the moment we just we count, we record how many um, how many reds, yellows, and greens there are after each list, um, in the hope that over time we'll see efficiency improve um, and and the kind of level of self-assessed teamwork improve. Um, so yeah, the the if if somebody was to put in a red chip, it wouldn't be discussed with the team then. Um, but what our colleague does, um, our colleague from Zuno does when she's doing her mentoring visit, she discusses the sort of overall figures. So if, if that team has had a lot of red chips, um, if, for example, over, uh, around teamwork that week, um, she'll try and discuss that uh, with, with the team as a whole during the debrief and see you know, whether anything can be identified for, from that. Um, and also involves the nurses in charge um, uh, in kind of reporting back to see if there, she can identify any themes that uh, maybe led to those red chips. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, oh, and I know you you have to um, you have to probably pull off now. Um, there's one other quick one if you do have time. So we've had just a question in from. Um, now, when Nadim, who's asked if you're, if there are future plans to run this project anywhere else other than Zambia, um, we don't have any plans at the moment. Um, I think this is um, this is a new project for us, and and we would really learn a lot from it at the RCN. Um, I think there's a lot of really positive stuff coming out of it, and um, a lot of things that we could really do better I suppose next time um, if we were if we were going to roll it out elsewhere um, but we don't have any firm um, firm plans to roll it out outside Zambia yet our next step is to take the lessons that we've learned at UTH and try and see see how that works at the district hospital because obviously that's a very different environment and with different challenges so um, see how that works there and then um, and then see where that takes us really Okay. Well, great. Thank you. And thanks again for your presentation um, and, and being able to stay a bit longer um, to answer some questions. Thank you. And if, if anyone does want to um, talk it through um, or have a discussion about it or email me for more information, then I'm very happy. Sorry to sorry to rush off. <laughs> oh, that's, that's no problem. Um, and yeah, and do get in contact and we can put you in contact um, with Ilona. Okay. okay. Thank thanks very much, everyone. No problem. So um, now I'd like to um, pass over to um, Thomas Weiser, who is um, an assistant professor of surgery at Stanford University um, and also um, a board member of Lifebox and was involved um, in WHO's Safe Surgery Lives program, um, which is, was involved in um, the implementation, evaluation and, and kind of promoted the WHO surgical safety checklist. Um, so uh, welcome, Tom, and I'll uh, pass over to you now. Well, 
thank you. Um, thank you, Pippa, and thank you, Alona, for your um, presentation and, and for inviting me today. Um, good morning from California. And let me see if I can get my screens. Uh, 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 Pippa, is this, is, can you see my screen now? Uh, yeah, so we can, see, we can see the slides. Perfect, thank you. Well, um, so um, my name is Thomas Weiser. I'm a general and trauma surgeon at Stanford University Medical Center. Uh, and I was involved in the WHO um, program called Safe Surgery Saves Lives, which uh, developed, which was responsible for developing and uh, implementing and testing and evaluating the original WHO checklist. And um, I'm also a board member of Lifebox, which is a charity both based in both the U.S. and the U.K. Um, that is uh, devoted to improving the safety of surgery, both um, both uh, in the U.S. and abroad. Um, initially, Lifebox came out of uh, the WHO checklist because one of the items on the checklist was the 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 kind of the the, the use of the mandatory use of pulse oximetry for monitoring patients under anesthesia, and uh, we recognized early on during the initial part of the program that this was going to be a resource that many hospitals, especially um, in low and middle income countries, might not be able to accommodate. And so we developed a charity to procure and distribute low-cost pulse oximeters along with training for anesthesia providers, both uh, MD and non-MD anesthesia providers. Um, and since its inception in 2011, we've uh, delivered uh, over 11,000 oximeters and trained um, over 5,000 uh, anesthesia providers. Um, and our oximeters have been used in probably 10 million operations. Um, and that was our first big step into uh, you know, the, the kind of practical world of, of surgical safety beyond the checklist or trying to support the checklist. And so what I'll be talking about today is, another, is our second technical program called Clean Cut, which is a checklist-based expansion uh, for antisepsis, antisepsis and infection control. And basically, it's, it's using the checklist to promote some of the infection prevention and control standards around, uh, around surgical, uh, surgical infection prevention. Um, so by disclosure, uh, I am a member of the Board of Lifebox. That's an unpaid uh, board membership. It's a charity. Um, but I do, uh, I am the, the, the principal investigator on the Clean Cut program, uh, which has been funded by the GE Foundation um, through Lifebox. Um, and I devote 30% of my time to this work. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this as well. So to start with, let me just uh, uh, introduce the, the WHO surgical checklist, surgical safety checklist. This is the WHO version, um, and it's divided into three uh, component parts: the uh, the what we call the sign-in or before induction of anesthesia, uh, the timeout that happens before skin incision, and then a sign-out before patient leaves the operating room while the team is still in place. Um, and the most important part of this checklist um, is that little. Um, that little blurb at the bottom that talks about how um, additions and modifications to fit local practice are encouraged. And this has been very, very important because uh, we recognize that the checklist can be very difficult to do and the checklist uh, and some of these steps um, uh, need to be rearranged depending on how the, um, the, uh, the, the surgical teams uh, and, and how, what the process of, of of anesthesia and, and surgical provision, how they occur locally. Um, you also notice in that first part that is there that one of the uh, items, that fourth item down, is is the pulse is there a pulse oximeter on the patient and functioning? And that was the work of that Lifebox um, originally set out to help uh, address, which was the use of a of pulse oximetry as a routine part of patient monitoring. So here's a, a, a picture of the Lifebox oximeter. Um, and as you can see, um, during an uh, a intervention like a cesarean section, uh, patients uh, who are under even even um, regional anesthesia, like a spinal, um, should be routinely monitored. One of the biggest issues that we've had um, in terms of surgical safety uh, involves uh, uh, infections and you know, post-operative uh, infectious complications. And so we recognize that as a next big part of the surgical safety movement. And so our work now is focused on that. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Clean Cut program and, and how Clean Cut is trying to support uh, the checklist implementation through a very kind of specific um, uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation and feedback process. 
And it was, this is great to follow Alona because uh, uh, her program is very focused on kind of the teamwork, the communication, some of the non, um, some of the more uh, qualitative aspects of, of, of teamwork and interaction. And our work is really focused very much on some of the quantitative aspects of checklist implementation vis-a-vis -vis the processes. And so I think these two are very, comp these two talks are very complementary. So as I, as I mentioned, um, this is work that we are currently piloting in two countries. Uh, we're piloting it in Cambodia and in Ethiopia. We have a pilot site in each country. Um, one is in uh, Batambang in Cambodia, which is about um, six hours north of Phnom Penh. It's a trauma hospital. It does about 5,000 operations a year. It's probably the only trauma center in the entire country um, and is certainly the only the major surgical referral center for the district that encompasses the great, essentially the northern half of Cambodia. Uh, and then we're also piloting it at Jimma University in Jimma, Ethiopia. Uh, Jimma University is in Jimma, about six hours drive uh, southwest of Addis Ababa. Um, it is also the major tertiary referral center. It's a fairly large university hospital um, with three operating theaters uh, for, the, for the general surgery and, uh, and gynecology as well as two to three operating, functional operating rooms for, um, for maternal care and for C-sections. Um, the work that, that, that the check, this clean cut work uh, is a checklist based intervention. And what we're trying to do is introduce the checklist, but then measure and evaluate the specific processes that underlie the checklist. And so by way of background, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we chose infections as our, um, uh, as our second part of work. So we know, uh, we know from, from work that we've done and others have done that in resource-poor settings, the risk of death or complications from surgery uh, can be up to 100 times higher than it is in, um, in, uh, in, in high resource settings. We also know from early work with WHO that there are approximately 77,000 operating theaters globally that are not equipped with pulse oximetry, which we consider an essential monitoring device for safe surgery. Um, this uh, any anesthetic society that creates guidelines around the provision of safe anesthesia has included pulse oximetry as, a, as an essential component of monitoring during anesthesia. And this was, the, this was um, again, the, the reason why we conceived of the, the whole uh, program of Lightbox to start with. Up to a third of, op of patients who have operations in the developing world are affected by surgical infections. So this is a huge number with a huge burden, both on the patient and on the health system. Patients who have surgical infections, um, uh, they stay longer in the hospital. They obviously, it obviously is more expensive. Uh, for the hospital and the health system to care for them. It's certainly more expensive out of pocket for patients to, to pay for. Um, and of course, those patients are then in, incapacitated, uh, resulting with some pretty significant morbidity and, can, and, and stay out of work longer, uh, which is also a huge financial burden, both to the patients individually and also to the families. The incidence of surgical infections rate range from between about 2% to as high as 24% per 100 surgical procedures. So again, very, very common uh, and very, very costly. We know from our original work with the WHO surgical safety checklist um, that, we, that, uh, that when implemented well and when implemented with high fidelity to the processes uh, with good communication and consistency of care, that we can reduce more, more, uh, mortality by almost 50% and all post-operative complications by as high as 30 to 35 percent on average. Um, we also know that, there, that it's possible to sustain the checklist, um, and we've done that uh, in multiple countries uh, with a combination of checklist implementation and, and oximetry distribution and training. Um, and in one country where we did this, uh, when we went back almost two years after our original implementation, we had decreased uh, infectious complications um, from 34% to up to below 5%. So this is a dramatic exponential decrease in surgical infections. Um, uh, and this was in an Eastern European country. And then we've in, in, sustained increases in non-physician uh, anesthetist knowledge of oximetry and hypoxia management, as well as incorporated um, oximeters into routine clinical practice. So that was the, the, the pulse oximetry, um, uh, and I've already talked about what we've accomplished thus far with oximetry. However, we now are working on infection prevention, um, 
and our program objectives uh, are fourfold. We want to engage local champions from the surgical, obstetric, anesthetic, and nursing disciplines. Um, we want to provide guidance on how to implement the checklist while, in, while also empowering the local processes and strengthening the local processes. We, we, we aim to refine and mature the program at these single pilot sites uh, in Cambodia and Ethiopia, and eventually through partnerships with collaborations that include NGOs, the professional societies, teaching institutions, uh, ministries, and peer-to-peer -peer networks to, to, to aim for a countrywide spread of this kind of program throughout both countries, and indeed other countries uh, as, we, as we find opportunities. The activities uh, are as follows. We, we first start by engaging local clinical staff and ident identify project champions, and those champions come from the disciplines of surgery, nursing, and anesthesia. We obtain uh, local buy-in by, uh, for the process. We uh, do some baseline surveys of some of the core processes that, under, that underlie infection prevention um, around um, uh, antibiotic delivery, the, um, the sterility of instruments, the integrity of the gowns and drapes, um, the cleanliness of the surgical wound and, and skin decontamination, uh, and then sponge and swab counting. And then we identify, so we, we attempt to identify root cause of, cause of process failures uh, and then find some local um, and contextually relevant um, uh, improvements uh, to bring compliance, or to bring these processes into compliance with the checklist. We try and standardize those processes um, and then again conduct monitoring and evaluation to provide ongoing feedback um, with, a, with a, the idea of, of uh, being able to show uh, performance improvement to the ministry and, and, and show wider spread. So um, the, first, the first of those, of those activities revolves around skin con decontamination. So we try and find out what's the process of skin antisepsis, um, what agents are available for, anti for, for skin decontamination, um, how well are those agents being used, and how routinely are they being used. Um, in effect, most of the hospitals that we work in and we've seen have a process for skin decontamination using, usually using iodine, um, but sometimes those processes need to be strengthened or sometimes the solutions that are being used are, are, are poorly, are poorly um, uh, the reagents are poorly mixed, um, and so sometimes we have to improve that process. But in general, compliance with this is fairly high, and it allows the uh, hospitals and surgical teams to identify something that they're doing well um, and pretty routinely. The second is the sterility of gowns, gloves, and drapes. And what we look at is how well the gowns are, in, how, you know, what's the integrity of those gowns? Um, are there holes or, or violations of the gowns and the, and the drapes? And if there are, what's the process for repairing them or for identifying new drapes? Typically, there's, there may be a, there's a process, but people don't really know it. So we've seen instances where there, there are holes in the drapes and they're kind of moved off the field, but then they're kind of packaged in a bundle, they end up getting reprocessed, and then three days later they're back on another patient with the same holes in them. And so we try and identify a process for repairing gowns and drapes that, are, that have uh, holes or, or other kind of sterility violations. And then in areas where there are, there's a process for obtaining new, fresh uh, sterile gloves, we help to strengthen and maintain that and create uh, local supply chains. And in places where those supply chains don't exist, where they're reprocessing gloves, uh, we attempt to identify how to either start a process or how to ensure that the, that the gloves that are being re-sterilized and reused are indeed being appropriately cleaned and decontaminated. Um, those two processes uh, tend to be fair, the two prior processes, skin decontamination and the integrity of the gowns and drapes, tend to be fairly straightforward. And, Usually, there's not a whole lot of problems with them, uh, at least in, 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 the, in the settings that we've currently worked in. Um, the, the next three are a lot more difficult to, to address. So the idea of decontamination and sterilization of instruments is pretty routine, but actually what we've frequently found is that there's no process to ensure that, that, contamination is, that decontamination and sterility can be confirmed. And so we try and identify ways that we try and identify what the process of decontamination is and we look to see whether or not there are some sort of there's some sort of indication of sterility either externally with with um, kind of tape that changes color for example or kind of internal markers and when they're not we try and find a local solution to ensure that sterility is is achieved by the sterile processing process um, so we look at how instruments are cleaned how instruments are sterilized how we confirm sterility um, and when we found uh, when we found deficits in this 
we then reconvene our team so that the um, so that the surgeon, the nurse, the anesthetist, and maybe a hospital administrator can then reach out to the sterile processing unit um, of the of the hospital to find out what their needs are, so that they can identify local solutions to problems with sterility. Um, antibiotic stewardship is a huge issue. We know that um, frequently antibiotics are are uh, are either misused or they're given inappropriately to either too early before skin incision or after the, the surgery is already underway, and that limits the the, the uh, efficacy of antibiotics. Um, so ideally, if antibiotics are to be used, they're to be used at the, at the most appropriate time, which is prior to um, uh, prior to skin incision, but not greater than one hour prior to skin incision. Um, we found huge lapses in this, uh, particularly when antibiotics are given on the ward, um, when patients are called for the OR. Or pa you know, patients will come with antibiotics that they've purchased uh, um, outside the hospital. They're given those antibiotics, and then a day or two later, they'll have their operation, which then, you know, the, the antibiotic is no longer efficacious at that point. So the idea is that we try and create a process by, by which the, an the anesthesiologist can give the antibiotic um, you know, at the right time in the OR prior to skin incision. Uh, we look at what antibiotics are available for use, how antibiotics are obtained, um, what that process is, how and when are they given, and who administers them, um, whether or not they're continued uh, postoperatively, and what the indication is for, an, uh, uh, for continuation of antibiotics. Then the protocols that exist, and if there aren't protocols, whether we can help strengthen those protocols. And sometimes we find that the antibiotics, uh, you know, in, in this instance, we often find that there are three reasons why, um, three main barriers. So one is a barrier of opportunity, that the antibiotics don't, are not available. Uh, second is an, a, a knowledge issue, that people don't know when antibiotics need to be given. Um, but most commonly, it's, it's what I call a system failure, a barrier of systems, where antibiotics are available and people know what they need to do, but the system isn't, isn't uh, able to get the antibiotic to the patient at the right time. And those tend to be the most challenging um, barrier. That tends to be the most challenging barrier because it requires kind of a huge behavioral change uh, for the surgical teams to get the antibiotic to into the operating room for the patients. Uh, and then finally, uh, sponge and swab counting. Um, we uh, in, in in almost every place we work, we hear stories about how retained uh, foreign bodies, particularly sponges and swabs. Um, and this uh, it typically uh, relates to uh, kind of lack of standardization of swab and sponge counts. Um, so we look at how instruments and swabs are tracked during surgery, how often the counting uh, occurs, and what happens when counts are off, and whether or not we can strengthen that process through, um, you, typically through uh, nursing or scrub technician training, um, and creating a system by which um, at least the swabs are kind of routinely counted, even for cases that don't involve an open body cavity, so that, it, that the process is, is, is strengthened and reinforced. Um, we are looking at outcomes, so we're, looking, we, we're doing wound surveillance at, all, at, our, at our two pilot sites with an idea of looking mostly at very objective criteria uh, around um, wound problems, uh, in particular uh, the reopening of, of closed wounds, the dehiscence of wounds, the the uh, or the failure of grafts and flaps, or the need for reoperation, um, but we try and uh, use local processes whenever whenever possible to inform our our surveillance. And the the way that we're looking at this is is through um, primarily through the processes. So we're looking very specifically. We have data collectors that look at skin preparation, the integrity of the gowns and drapes, the efficacy of decontamination of instruments, the appropriate selection of antibiotics. Um, and the routine counting of sponges. And this is a direct observation by data collectors in the OR um, to help reinforce the process, not just the, the use of the checklist, but whether or not these processes are actually happening. Because what we found is many places will say that they, they use the checklist and they'll show a completed checklist form, but in fact the processes are not actually being done because, uh, because of compliance issues. And then also we're trying to relate these to secondary outcomes that are very patient, that are very important patient outcomes around surgical infections, need for reoperation, the length of stay, and whether or not there's a postoperative mortality. Um, and so that's that's the basis of our program. Um, it's it's very uh, objective and with respect to um, it's very objective with respect to. Um, sorry, I lost my slides here. Um, It's very objective with respect to how we're measuring this program. 
um, and each of these processes are, are processes that we're using to help reinforce the checklist beyond just evaluating whether or not the checklist is being used. So I'm happy to take questions and, um, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to, to present this work. Great. Um, thanks so much, Tom. Um, it was uh, it's really interesting to hear um, about those kind of further developments after the checkbox and, and some of the further work um, that Lifebox is doing. Um, at the moment, now we're gonna um, I'm gonna move straight on to Walt's presentation, and then we'll take questions um, on both of them at the end, uh, if that's okay. Um, so our last presenter is um, Walter Johnson, who's the lead for the Emergency and Essential Surgical Care Program um, at the World Health Organization. Um, so I'll hand over to you now, Walt. All right, thanks. Um, there's my slides. Well, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to represent the World Health Organization. Uh, my background is neurosurgery. And um, so I want to talk a, a little bit about the larger context of WHO programs that have to do with patient safety. Um, there's not a number of issues uh, that are all within uh, where the surgical checklist lies, um, and it's part of a broader system. If I can't get my slides to move. Sorry, well, I was just unmuting myself. There we go. You are. <laughs> there we go. All right. So the surgery program at WHO started over a decade ago um, by Dr. Mina Cherian. And there was a number of initiatives at that time mostly having to do with studying surgical care in countries. We had a global initiative uh, that currently has 2,200 members. Um, but all the work we were doing, the main, the main thing that we knew was that the whole world was shifting from communicable to non-communicable diseases, aging populations, and this whole shift was giving um, all these new, or not new, but uh, broader non-communicable disease, all those diseases required more surgical care than the communicable diseases did. So surgery was becoming more and more an important part of healthcare throughout the world. 2015 was a banner year for surgery. There was a number of things that happened all within about two months of each other. First was the Lancet Commission uh, on Global Surgery, which came out that really changed our understanding of the need around the world for surgery, the cost that it um, uh, occurred on people. The um, World Bank's uh, Disease Control Priorities third edition, volume one, was on essential surgery. The Millennium Development Goals expired in 2015, and they were replaced through the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, number three, for example, has about eight factors having to do with surgery, where the Millennium Development Goals only had about three. There's much more surgical care and anesthesia involved with the uh, SDGs uh, going forward for the next 15 years. And then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, the World Health Assembly, which is our governing body, passed a resolution strengthening emergency and essential surgical care and anesthesia as a component of universal health coverage. That was passed in May of 2015. This resolution basically had five parts. There was a lot of parts, but if you really distilled it down to the essence, it had to do with advocacy and resource development care delivery, such as access to care, integration of systems, um, information management, was data collecting, analyzing that data, and then using that data to actually drive health policy, and then continue with monitoring and evaluation. Essential medicines and then the surgical workforce, who to train, how to train them, how do you uh, know that someone's competent, how do you oversee that, and um, those types of issues. And then we have to report back to World Health Assembly next year. 
Uh, what does that have to do with the surgical checklist? Well, there's several parts of the resolution that had to do with quality of care. Um, I've listed five of them here, but they're all about uh, developing systems for quality, safe, effective, and affordable emergency and essential surgical care. Uh, essential medicines that are safe, efficacious, and affordable. Uh, data collection, post-operative mortality rate. Strength and in infection prevention and control is a critical part to ensure quality and safety of uh, surgery and anesthesia. And then devise relevant measures to access to safe and uh, effective emergency and essential surgical care, just for starters. So we had a number of meetings that uh, we brought stakeholders together from all over the world to talk about each one of these components of the resolution, how we could best move forward towards implementation. This was our last meeting uh, in Geneva in December, which happened to be the 10th anniversary meeting of the Global Initiative. Um, there's about 150 people here, and, and we had small group sessions all discussing how we could move forward, and we came up with a roadmap towards implementation of this resolution uh, that is now uh, on our website. And most importantly, we came up with a timeline that just structuring what our goals were over the next five years, uh, globally, regionally, and nationally. And quite importantly, the last column, which I can't see, but it's who our partners are going to be to help drive this forward. So after all these meetings and developing a roadmap, the key recommendations are uh, to foster advocacy, develop funding uh, both globally and at country level, and try to get the ministries of health to take ownership of this process. We want to improve access to care, system integration, develop quality measures, and then develop dashboards for ministries of health to look at all the key indicators. Uh, we, we have uh, some core indicators, and at the country level, um, uh, national surgical care plans, which would be driven by the data that we collected. Encourage ministries of health and others uh, on essential medicines, limit illegal use, but make uh, legal things uh, available to patients, and then develop minimal standards for credentialing. So as far as data collection, Peter Drucker said, you can't manage what you don't measure, and that is very true. So the WHO put together last year uh, monitoring the building blocks of health systems, uh, which really uh, boils down to 100 core health indicators if you look on the right side of the screen under health systems, there are where the six core surgical uh, indicators are located. These are agree with the Lancet Commission's six core indicators of what should be um, assessed for surgical care, post-operative mortality rate, um, surgical volume, two-hour access to surgical care, surgeon, anesthetist, obstetrician density, catastrophic and impoverishing expenditure, these six. Four of these were uh, accepted by the World Bank uh, in the World Development Indicators and uh, just this year. Postoperative mortality rate is very difficult to get from around the world, um, so that was left off as was a two-hour access. Surgical volume, surgical anesthesia, obstetrics density, and then the expenditures. Essential medicines, uh, the most important one, Tom has always already alluded to this about the antibiotic utilization. Uh, that's very important. Narcotics, 80% uh, of narcotics virtually is in six countries. The majority of the uh, developing world has no access to narcotics. And ketamine is a, is a critical medicine that's used in the developing world for short surgical cases. And then training and credentialing, as I mentioned. Our partners are very many, and they're important. Uh, these are the experts at training, credentialing, uh, et cetera, and they're very important partners of ours. 
our global surgical workforce, uh, this the SAO density, we will be adding to this this summer the number of neurosurgeons globally, plastic surgeons, and orthopedics. So how does the surgical checklist uh, fit into all this? Well, as Andrew said in the very beginning, it depends on the entire health system. You can have a perfect surgical checklist. You can do a perfect surgery, but if your whole system doesn't work, there's holes in the drapes, there's unsterile instruments, the antibiotics are given at the wrong time, etc., then the checklist isn't going to get you too far. But I want to go through a few of the objectives of the checklist. It's basically saying operating on the correct patient at the croc site, doing the correct surgery. You want to prevent any harm from anesthesia, prepare for any life-threatening loss of airway or high blood loss. Um, you want to look at allergic reaction from your medication, minimize surgical site infection risk, not have retained uh, foreign bodies, uh, identify surgical specimen, and communicate as a team uh, for the patient's well-being. There's five surgical vital statistics that are part of the checklist. The number of that the data should be collected by each of the WHO member states, number of operating rooms in each country, number of operating uh, the operations performed, the number of trained surgeons and anesthetists and obstetricians, and then the deaths uh, on the day of surgery and certainly in, in hospital deaths after surgery. The checklist principle that should be simple, should be widely applicable, and it should be measurable. And as uh, was stated earlier, it should be adapted to local use. The WHO on their website uh, under patient safety has both of these guidebooks that are easily downloadable. Um, one on the guidelines for safe surgery, which includes the uh, surgical checklist, and then the implementation manual that gives just some good advice on how to pull this off. This is what the website looks like. There's a number of other things, safe surgery review, uh, pulse oximetry uh, project, the uh, robotic surgery um, safety uh, website, and then some other ones. So the surgical safety checklist and the implementation manual are in six different languages. And then there's probably a hundred examples of how the checklist has been adapted to local use and each of these hospitals has, has changed it in small to large ways. Um, and they post it on the website for you to look at and uh, perhaps to give you some ideas of how your checklist might change. We also have a safe child book checklist and um, this summer in August will be the unveiling of the uh, trauma checklist at the trauma meeting in India this August. Other initiatives that WHO is carrying out is surgical unit based safety program which is really a surgical site infection uh, prevention uh, program that has been used in a number of countries. Um, with some success. This is all on the website and you can read about it there. I won't go into great detail. But basically it, it has three parts, preoperative, perioperative, and in, intraoperative. And if you can't read that, um, it has to do with patient bathing, avoiding shaving of hair, uh, good surgical hand preparation, correct antibiotic use, and then intraoperatively skin preparation and discipline in the operating room. There's also a clean care is safe care and the clean hands campaign. The clean hands day was May 5 if you missed it. But there's uh, it's just about hand hygiene, washing your hands between patients, um, etc. And participants all over the world that were part of the clean hands network. And why is this important? Well, I was just working today on a paper about the uh, country of Uganda and the district hospitals. 78% of the district hospitals have no water continuously or at all. So it means when we're telling nurses and other people, well, 
just wash your hands between patients. It's not a simple matter. And with oxygen not there, electricity not there, it's a very difficult thing to carry out all these hand washing, safe surgery types of initiatives. Lastly, I just wanted to, we talk about all these things that we're doing as a team for the patient, but also we need to include the patient in this. And we put out a small brochure uh, for patient safety, what you need to know before and after surgery, what to ask your doctors, because really the surgical team is really important, but we can't forget the patient in all this. Lastly, the WASH program, which is water, sanitation, and hygiene, um, is an important thing that we're doing. Uh, it less to do with surgical site infection, but it's part of the whole context of how we're trying to, to uh, reduce infections and make the world a safer place. And with that, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Walt. Um, Thanks for a really informative presentation. It was great um, to get that kind of broader, um, high-level view of the environment which some of these um, projects are working in and, and the background from um, the WHO perspective on, on the work that they're doing around this. Um, so now we have time um, for questions and, and discussion. So unfortunately, Ilona, um, has gone and isn't able to join us for this section, but if you have any comments or questions for, for Tom or, or Walt, um, please get in touch now. Um, so again, you can do it through those two ways. If you've got a microphone, um, then you can put up your hand using the little yellow hand button, um, and we'll then invite you to speak. Um, alternatively, you can um, type the question in uh, the control panel, um, and we can read those out um, to the panelists um, and so Walt and Tom I'll have you and Andrew I'll have you all on um, a mute at the moment so as we kind of ask questions you, you can chip in with answers um, so we have one in already from um, Dr Daniel Makawa from Chipata Central Hospital in eastern Zambia um, and he said, uh, thanks, Tom, for the, for the presentation. His question was, um, do you have a tool that captures information as the patient leaves the theatre postoperatively? And who is responsible for the data capture? And who validates the data? Yeah, so that, that, uh, great questions. So we capture the, the data collection right now. There's, there's two ways that we're capturing data. One is on a paper form. Uh, and that's what, how we're going to be doing it. That's how we do it in Jima, in um, in, Cam in in Batambang, and in, in Cambodia. We actually have because the hospital has a wireless connection. We're capturing it uh, using a tablet um, and a red cap survey. So that's that's it's actually a, an electronic data capture form. What we do is we, we have data collectors who are observing the the surgery. So they've been trained. The data collectors are trained in what to look for. Occasionally, they try to be as uh, as as unobtrusive as possible. So occasionally they'll have to ask the anesthetist, you know, if and when antibiotics were given, or they'll have to ask the, 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 the scrub nurse or scrub tech, uh, you know, what the number of sponges are, um, uh, or how many have been counted. Um, but they try to just do everything by observation alone. We're, we're, we're only capturing, we're not doing, we're not capturing the checklist per se. In other words, the data the data collector is not looking to see whether or not the checklist has been completed. Um, he or she is just looking at the processes. The idea being that the teams are all saying that they're using the checklist, and we've noted that the teams are using the checklist. It's not whether or not they're using them; it's whether or not they're actually doing the the each of the steps the checklist is asking. Um, uh, so we're not doing, for example, we're not checking to see whether or not the kind of the, the sign out happens at the end of the case or not. Um, the, the the data collector is asking how many sponges are are you know are in the count at the end of the case, for example. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm happy to share the actual data collection tool with you, um, although it takes a little bit of training for the data collector to be able to use it. Um, 
the validation is a really good a really good question. So actually, for the two pilot studies, I have um, two of my research fellows are on site and they're doing a validation of about 20 percent of the collected data. Um, where they go in and they kind of observe how the data collector is collecting. So we are trying to validate whether or not the data are being are, are being accurately collect, collected. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Yeah, Daniel's just also typed in. Um, he said he's asked the question as they tend to have limited stuff available to capture the data, um, so leading to errors in, in data compil compilation. Um, and he said, yes, that, that does answer the question. So thank you. And, and we can uh, maybe put you um, in contact with each other um, after the webinar. Um, absolutely. To share, to share that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great. Um, so I think uh, Andrew also has a question uh, for Tom. Yeah, thank you. Well, actually, perhaps for, for Tom and, and Walt. And um, I'm just going to play devil's advocate for a moment. Um, because there are folk out there who say that using the checklist ideas taken from industry is uh, too simplistic in a complex clinical setting. Is there some truth in that? So let, let me let me let me um, let me take take the first stab at that. Um, so so I, I would disagree. Uh, in fact, even in the most complex circumstances, uh, checklists have been shown to be highly efficacious when they're used well. Um, and uh, there is there is absolutely a difference between medicine and almost other high complexity in uh, industry. So you know the typical one is the is nuclear power or or the airline industry. And the the reason that it's different is you can engineer the environment of nuclear power and an airline and an aircraft, but you can't engineer the safety of a patient. Patients come in, with incredible complexity. And they come with an incredible diversity of conditions. It's almost impossible to accommodate for all that. However, with the, the idea of checklists in all these high, what so-called high reliability organizations, is to promote communication. So that because there are so many ways for these complex processes to fail, especially in medicine, but inevitably there's somebody in the room who can help troubleshoot. And so when problems arise. When patients start get you know getting sick or starting to show instability, communicating that instability and asking for help is is, is part of the way checklists help promote communication. So as communication is triggered and promoted, people are more likely to ask for help and and interact so that that people can troubleshoot together. And that is actually incredibly powerful. And it's one of the reasons on the checklist we have a whole introduction piece. So I would not be I would not argue that, that just introducing yourself is a is is necessarily you know critical to patient safety, but it is critical to communication because by people introducing themselves, they're then activated to participate in the care of the patient. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I would I would add to that, if I may, Andrew. Um, Alona alluded to this in the beginning when she said that the biggest pushback was from senior surgeons and we've learned from the um, airline industry that one of the big risks was no one questioning the captain even when he was demented and that goes for surgical teams as well. It's it, All of us have to be part of that team. and. Uh, as the senior most surgeon on this webinar, I have to confess I was probably guilty of that on occasion too. But it's really getting the team approach uh, to work and getting people to communicate because nobody can do this all by themselves. That's great. Thank you very much. Back to Pippa. Okay. Um, I think Walt also had a question um, for Tom. I have a question for you, Tom. Um, what do you do about the X factor, the unknowns? Um, for example, you know, in some developing, even some developed countries, uh, you have an occasional flying insect in the operating room. You have anesthesia in the middle of the case, putting in IVs in a less than sterile fashion, or um, some developing countries, you have patients two to a bed post-operatively and they put, may put a post-op 
a fresh post-op in with an infected wound. Um, it really changes your statistics drastically when those kind of things happen. How do you factor that into what you're doing? Yes, so this is, you know, these are these are huge problems and huge issues that, that, that relate exactly to the resource uh, kind of constraints that, um, that Alona originally uh, alluded to in the first presentation. Um, the truth is we'll not, you know, we'll never solve all the problems uh, that we're trying in kind of a typical public health fashion to identify some of the low-hanging fruit and make some uh, some changes that we know are doable and um, uh, and that we can that we can actually make that we can accomplish uh, in you know in the time frame that we have for our this initial um, this initial work. Um, clear you know clearly post post operative complications and most post operative deaths occur way after the surgery is completed. Um, uh, except for the problem of, of, of a loss of airway. So occasionally patients will will die of exsanguination, but that's fairly rare. Most patients who die, die either from an airway catastrophe or some kind of cardiovascular collapse with, with, from the anesthetic, or they die postoperatively from overwhelming infection or something, you know, or, or postoperative bleeding that goes unrecognized. Um, and so uh, it's going to be really hard to capture those those pieces. It's very it's been very interesting though because in, in our experience, I mean, this is anecdotal. I don't have evidence for this, but in our experience, once you start getting these teams to start, you know, looking into the processes, they find all sorts of, of things one didn't expect, like what you're mentioning, like like cohorting of patient, you know, inappropriate cohorting of patients, and all of a sudden. The nurses, the ward nurses, are 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 engaged and invested in trying to identify ways to avoid those kind of problems. And so, I suspect that we'll find pretty dramatic effects. Not just because we've got these five items, um, you know, these five processes that we're measuring better, uh, better um, kind of aligned, but actually there'll be all sorts of reverberative effects that happen on the wards, that happen in the pharmacy, that happen uh, on the obstetric units. Uh, for example, they go way way beyond just these five items, and, and we noticed that with the checklist itself. You know, there were there were there were hospitals, uh, in particularly hospitals in the uh, high income countries, that didn't change all that much with respect to their their compliance with processes, but still had outcome improvements. And it's probably because they were identifying problems that went beyond what we were actually measuring and starting to make changes in the processes that that we could never have captured, um, and that's okay. Great, thank you. Great. Um, so we've just we've got a couple more um, quick questions in here. There's one um, come in that's asked both to um, Walt and Tom um, if they if they know of any ways um, in which students can join in um, programs uh, initiated by Lifebox and WHO in this area. They can go to the who.int slash surgery website and there's a link that uh, says contact us and you can click on that and send me an email. Um, for, for Lifebox we do, if you go to uh, www.lifebox.org, O-R-G, um, we have a website where, where you can connect with us as well. Um, the, uh, there's a couple of ways that students can get involved from uh, either from the U.S. or the U.K. specifically because our organizations are based there, and that re revolves mostly around kind of helping with advocacy, um, you know, helping with fundraising because we're a charity, those kind of things. With respect to actual clinical work, it becomes a little bit more difficult because what we really need are, are local teams and people with with um, who spend time locally, um, and that tends to be, you know, in Ethiopia, the, the Ethiopian surgeons and nurses and anesthetists, so the, 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 clinic, the point of care clinicians um, and the administrators. Um, and it's much harder for international students from outside those countries to get involved because of the regulations and because of the, the kind of the technical, technical issues around, you know, kind of how, what kind of technical capacity the students themselves have. Um, so typically, uh, you know, for medical students or residents who have a little bit more sophistication with respect to medical care, there are, are some options. But um, for for non-medical students, it's it's pretty it's, it gets pretty difficult. Great, thank you. Um, 
I think a couple of people are just asking for those um, web addresses again, but we can um, we'll send those out to you um, afterwards, and the recording um, of this Q and A session will be available. But um, we'll email those out to you. Um, so this is one uh, final question that we have um, asked to Walt. Um, that's from Daniel, um, who's asked, um, who says he really appreciates his appreciates the the hype on including surgery and anesthesia in the universal health coverage um, but he's asked how are countries in Africa performing um, on this indicator if the number of surgically trained doctors and and anaesthetists are so few and scantily distributed so if I understand the question correctly how are countries in in the developing world doing on the surgeon, anesthetist, obstetric workforce density? Yeah. How are they doing? Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, Daniel said yes. Well, it's a very tough thing. Um, some countries are doing much better than others. They're, you know, this resolution was passed a year ago, and people have been working a long time to develop surgical workforce and by that I mean all you know surgeons of all types obstetricians and anesthesiologists um, it is going to be an ongoing problem for a long time because you know they estimate just for general surgeons they probably need 50,000 for the continent of Africa you don't train people overnight in that capacity. So it's who to train, how to train them, do we have mid-position providers, the uh, non-physician clinicians that are taught how to do surgical procedures, the essential ones. Um, it is a huge issue that we're working on. Um, it's no one answer, it's going to be a whole mosaic of answers that lots of little pieces that fit in to make the whole. But um, it's some countries are doing better than others, but it's uh, it's going to be an ongoing issue for quite some time. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Walt. Um, so I think that that's all the questions um, we seem to have for now. Um, but thanks. It's been some really great discussion. And if anybody listening. Um, live or future on YouTube does have any more comments um, then please feel to get in touch with us um, at FET. Um, before we go um, I'd just like to highlight some of um, our other upcoming events at FET. Um, so the next installment of the HBS presentation series will be um, um, a webinar on mental health with three projects um, presenting on the 26th of July um, and registration for that will be available um, on our website from around the 26th of June and will be publicized um, on Twitter and in other FET media outlets. Um, additionally, um, FET's annual conference is on the 20th to 21st of October this year and we'll focus on impact evaluation and effectiveness. Um, tickets that are, are available to buy now on our website um, and uh, there's a link here um, on the slide so when it's on YouTube you should be able to access that. Um, and as I said any other questions please feel free to email us at hps at set.org. Um, and also just to point out that um, check out our YouTube channel so this presentation will be up um, tomorrow and all previous episodes of the HPS presentation series are, are, are available um, so that's YouTube um, FET partnerships um, and lastly I'd very much like to thank um, all of you for attending the webinar today um, and of course a great thank you to all of our present presenters Ilona, Tom and Walt, um, who've all provided a great insight um, at different levels of the implementation of the Safe Surgery Checklist. Um, so that's, that's all from us here, um, and bye for now. <laughs>